is of Dale C. Bronner. As you know, we are teaching a series here in the book of Acts, and uh, this is series part number 24. And we're in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. The 15th chapter of the book of Acts. And this is dealing with resolving kingdom conflict. Now, you know if they had conflict in the kingdom, you're going to have a little conflict in your house from time to time and on your job. If you're in a relationship, it's not a matter of if you're going to have con conflict. It's a matter of when you're going to have conflict. You don't even have to have two people to have conflict. You can be all by yourself and be conflicted. <laughs> Your mind twisted in one direction and then in another, and you are conflicted as to whether you should eat or fast. And I don't know, but every time that I have fasted, I have been conflicted as to when I should break it. <laughs> and I don't know whether you have ever found this out to be true or not, but every time you fast, every time I fast, the best meal that you could ever eat is always the first meal after your fast. <laughs> I'm, I'm just sorry. It's just, there's no meal that compares to the meal that you have right after you finish fasting. I'm just telling you. It's, it's, it's absolutely astounding. But here in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, we want to be able to gain some understanding here. And I want you to know that we cannot gain a full understanding of what Luke is describing here in the 15th chapter of Acts without first being aware of some of the underlying situation that actually provokes here this calling of this unprecedented summit uh, meeting here of the church leaders that are at the Council of Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas had actually planted a, at least four churches in Galatia in the cities of Antioch of Pisidia and Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. And what must have been Paul's worst case scenario had unfolded in these new churches while Paul and Barnabas were on furlough. And more rapidly than they would have expected, some of the church leaders from Jerusalem had actually visited the Galatian church here and uh, without the consent of either Paul or Barnabas, and they began uh, this uh, contradicting the essence of what the message of salvation that Paul had preached to the God-fearers and the other Gentiles in these particular churches here in Galatia. And so now the Jerusalem council comes to consider the matter. And let's just begin reading here in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea, and they taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, now, when the Bible says that they had no small dispute, in other words, there was a big blowout over this. There was no small dissension here and dispute with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. And so being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, uh, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of, law of Moses. And now the council and elders came together to consider this matter. If you ever get into a conflict, you need to pull some folks together who have some sense and let them sort out the matter, let them discuss it. Now, if you have a truth and you believe the truth, you should never be afraid to discuss truth that you believe. Truth will defend itself. You don't have to be concerned that if you know the truth, that somebody is going to trip you up. Just know the truth and be set free by that truth. But get respectable people that are knowledgeable in particular things because a person's judgment is no better than their knowledge. And that's why I said you need knowledgeable, informed individuals to cons uh, consider the matter who were schooled in the law and who had reasonable common sense to be able to discern whether this is something legitimate or not. 
And, and, and notice, I want you to realize here that in verse, um, verse 7, that when there had been much dispute, you see, this was, this was a major issue. You do realize that wars have broken out over religious issues. And they, these religious wars break out because there is some conflict with others who are around them and they don't learn how to do a godly resolve. And I want to teach us some things in this session about resolving conflict, kingdom conflict. You're going to have conflict in the kingdom. Peter was a, was a, a, a wise man here. Peter rose up and he said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by the mouth of uh, uh, the Gentiles should hear the, but by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And Peter goes on to narrate this thing to say, listen, listen, listen. We can't come here and mandate that these folks be circumcised because God knowing their hearts, acknowledged their hearts, and God gave them the Holy Spirit just like he gave us the Holy Spirit. And he's saying that, listen, he gave them the Holy Spirit without their being circumcised, so now why should they have to go and be circumcised under our Jewish traditions? And Peter's ministry was primarily to the, to the Jews. But remember, God used him at Cornelius' house to, to help minister to Gentiles and I believe to establish a pattern of, of ministry to the Gentile nations of the world without their having to adopt all of the religious trappings of Judaism. And so they were in some serious situations here. So Peter stood up and he just preached to them and convinced them on how the Holy Spirit had been given to them that if, if God were not in this, in connecting the Jews without their coming through all of the other Jewish traditions, he would have waited until they had met all of the other Jewish requirements before he gave them the Holy Spirit. And that became a seal or a sign to them. And then when he, when he gets on, on, on down in the story, he begins to uh, talk about uh, the apostle, well, actually the apostle James stood up. Uh, and uh, James was, was one of the leaders in the church there in the Jerusalem. And uh, the apostle James uh, talked about how the scriptures, the scriptures confirmed what Peter had just expressed. Uh, and P Peter begins to tell him, you notice verse, uh, verse 16 here. And uh, uh, what, verse 15 here, it says, and th with this, the words of the prophets agree. He was talking about with what Peter had just stood up and shared. He says, just as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind might, uh, may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. And he was, of course, quoting from the ninth chapter of the book of Amos, verse 11 and 12. So he's, he's letting us know that what you're seeing in demonstration here is not something strange, but what Peter just told you is true, and the confirmation that what Peter has told you is true is that Amos the prophet, hundreds of years ago, prophesied concerning this. You remember when on the day of Pentecost, uh, you know, uh, the folks were filled and they supposed that they had been uh, drunk with wine? But this is that which Joel the prophet talked about. He said, this that you're seeing right now is that. Now, that's why when you get ready to, to, to pull a council to discuss something intelligently, you got to understand and bring people to the table who understood that which had been prophesied so that they'll understand this. And so if you didn't understand that, you wouldn't know how to interpret this as the fulfillment of that which the prophet spoke. So you have to have folks that are schooled in what the prophet said of old so that when God reveals something, uh, and, uh, fulfills something that had been prophetically declared, you will see it, know it, and understand it. So they brought individuals that were knowledgeable in the word of the Lord. They were knowledgeable in God's holy word. They were knowledgeable in the word. They understood it. And so they are interpreting this now in the light of, of scripture from the Old Testament and they're walking in a prophetic revelation of it. And from this, you, you'll notice from verse 22 all the way down through verse 29, what emerged out of this is, is known as the Jerusalem decree. 
after you pull the counsel, you've heard the matter, you've listened to it, and now uh, you, you come to some resolution, resolution, you, there, you come to a resolve. You know how if you've ever had these political people to come and they, they whereas this and whereas that and whereas this, and then they said, therefore be it resolved, that. You want to get down to the nitty gritty of what the resolve, now what's going to happen as a result of all of these whereases? <laughs> you know, you want to get down, be it resolved, that. That's where you're going to come down. So they came, and, and after they had gone through all of this heavy, heated debate, and they dealt with things scripturally, they were not just emotional, talking about, well, well in a way it seemed like to me. No, 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 no. You can't be done by what it seemed like to you. You better have a chapter and a verse. You better be able to point this thing back to the Scriptures to say, listen, this is what the Bible is talking about. Here's the biblical principle of which I speak. And, and then you have to be able to share things, your testimony. Peter spoke experientially. James spoke scripturally. But he took the experience that Peter talked about that, listen, he says, listen, how are we going to require this imposition on these people? God didn't require it of them. God confirmed them as his own by giving them his Holy Spirit. He wouldn't have given them his spirit if they, they were not his. And if they had to fulfill all of these other requirements in order to become his. So when it's, it's almost as though you, you're taking a person and you've already granted them citizenship rights. And now you're coming back and telling them that what what all they have to do in order to earn their rights as a citizen. And God has bypassed that whole process and said, when I give you the seal of my spirit, that means you are mine. You are, you are bought with a price. You belong to me now. So the Jerusalem decree that, this, that came out of the Jerusalem council uh, meeting, it basically stated these few things. That number one, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. They did come to that resolution. You do not have to be circumcised to be saved. You don't have to be circumcised to be saved. And uh, they, they did resolve this because they, they, they want them to, listen, you need to have circumcision and you need to adhere to all of the law of Moses. They, they came down to these three things in addition to saying that you don't have to be circumcised. They did say you must abstain from things offered to idols, anything that looks like idolatry, which is good and true. Abstain from blood, uh, from uh, things strangled. You know, the life is in the blood and its blood is sacred. And, and then abstain from sexual immorality. So those were the, the, the resolutions that came out of this Jerusalem council, the Jerusalem council. Now, I don't know who's on the council today when they bring up things for theological debate. But it would help if you put saved people on the council and folks filled with the Holy Ghost on the council and folks that are knowledgeable in the scriptures on the council as opposed to just people who are educated, who may not understand the heart of the principles of God where you need to understand God's word by revelation so that you do not violate the spirit of the law by being cunning with a letter of the law. It's amazing that some individuals, I, I, I become grieved sometimes when I see the religiosity of some individuals uh, who have learned more the tricks of the trade than to learn the trade itself. There's a thought, learn the trade. Don't major in the tricks. But this entire 15th chapter dealt with the conflict that arose here because they had sent these folks from the main church at Jerusalem down uh, to Galatia to try to correct what Paul and Barnabas had taught the people there, letting them know that you are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And now the council from Jerusalem comes down to put an imposition of the Jewish law on them, telling them you can't be saved without being circumcised. And here they had been filled with the Holy Ghost, and they were uncircumcised. And I guess they like to explain what happened to me. 
you know, they were confused. And so they brought dissension into the church. And that's why they then called this Jerusalem council, sent respectable men there, and uh, they debated the issue. They looked at it scripturally and experientially to see what is it that God has said. These were prophets and apostles that could understand and had an ability to be able to hear the voice of God so they could settle the disputes. Please don't try to settle disputes if you have no ear to hear God's voice. Because you need to have a revelation of the mind of Christ when you're in a dispute. That's when you need to ask the question, what would Jesus do? Get his mind, get his, get his thoughts. But not only did uh, this Jerusalem council issue a Jerusalem decree that basically said you don't have to be circumcised in order to be saved and you need to abstain from things offered to idols, abstain from the blood of things uh, strangled, and then abstain from sexual immorality. But uh, later on in this chapter, you, you'll notice in verse 36 down through 40, what happened, Paul and Barnabas got into it. Now, th this was his boy. The, the, the argument got so heated between these two apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ who had been working passionately together for the cause of Jesus Christ and Paul and Barnabas got into it over Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, who had been with them on one journey, got intimidated by what happened, and John Mark got homesick and said, I'm going back home. And Paul said, listen, I don't have time for your relative. He said, I need people who are going to be with me. I got a job to do. I don't want to carry anybody with me that I can't depend on. Where's John Mark now? He's like, look, look, Barnabas, I know you love him and everything, but listen, I got a job to do. My days are numbered on this earth. I got an assignment. He had to run. I mean, how many of you know when you get a certain age, you realize you are not going to live forever, and God puts a divine mandate on your life? You don't have time to deal with folks that are withdrawing from the process and leaving you hanging. You got to have somebody that you know is with you. I mean, I understand Paul. I understand Barnabas too. Barnabas was an encourager. And so the argument was so heated and they brought no resolve to it. Peter, I mean, Paul and Barnabas ended up going their separate ways and you don't ever hear about Barnabas again. And Paul says, I will replace you. And Paul chose Silas. And now, instead of Paul and Barnabas, now you start hearing about Paul and Silas. Next thing you know, we'll hear in a little bit later, we're going to learn about Paul and Silas when they went to jail and had a jailhouse rock. <laughs> that could have been Barnabas. But Barnabas and Paul got into a heated argument over his relatives. Did I tell you that God gives you family, the devil gives you relatives? <laughs> I cannot tell you, but folks that get bent out of shape now over their relatives, over their relatives who come and overstay their, their welcome and, and uh, start interfering with how things are done in your house and bombing money off of y'all and doing all kind of stuff, you know, and just get into trouble. Just keep looking straight ahead. I, I, don't, want, I don't want any of your relatives, you know, to think that, you know, anything funny is going on that you're thinking anything, you know, just, just look straight ahead. But I, I'm so glad that this was included in the Scripture because these holy men of God, through whom miracles were worked. Are you listening? I mean, Paul worked miracles. This man would walk by people, his shadow fell on him and he got healed. He's a bad boy. I mean, anointed. And, and, and Barnabas had an incredible spirit. He was a great encourager. That's why when Paul said, I don't want anything to do with John Mark, I don't want anything to do. He said, listen, you take John Mark and go on your way. Leave, leave here. Flee from before my presence. Saturate the place with your absence. <laughs> I mean, he, made, he just made it clear in, a, in, a, in an abundance of, of ways. And Barnabas being the encourager, his name means encourager. He's an encourager. Now he goes with John Mark, who's feeling really rejected now. And Barnabas begins to encourage him. But you know the good thing about it, 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 the story is not over. I don't want you to think that, that Paul never ever used John Mark anymore, the very young man that was fickle in his younger days. After a while, John Mark became very faithful. And Paul, writing in his letter to Timothy, he said, you know what, they'd left... Uh, Luke, but he said, bring with you John Mark because he is profitable for me for the ministry. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. 
So at one point, he wasn't ready. He was immature. And this just shows you how Paul's heart was right. Paul's heart was right. And so he, he walked through that, and, and that was actually a restoration with John Mark coming later on to work with Paul, the apostle. But here the unsettling news from the, from the Galatian churches, it provoked Paul to write his first epistle, which was the epistle to the Galatians. The Judaizers, they came in uh, to the churches that Paul and Barnabas had established and began teaching that salvation by faith alone is incomplete. And, and it was erroneous. And they argued that only through doing good works, such as circumcision and keeping the law, will God accept them into his family. Really. But I want you to notice some of Paul's words as he addresses the situation to the churches in Galatia. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Paul says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul was laying it out. I mean, Paul didn't plead. Paul didn't say, I don't have time to mince my words here. He, he just laid it out clear. He, Paul goes on to say, Galatians chapter 1, verse 9, he says, As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. He said, I don't care if they come from the, 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 the council in Jerusalem. If they preach any other gospel than what we've told you, if they tell you anything other than you can be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that it is not of works. If somebody comes preaching anything else, he says, let them be accursed. Now, that is some very strong language because the word accursed means to be delivered to destruction by God. That's a strong word. Let him be accursed. It means to be delivered to destruction by God. You don't want to be accursed. Paul was really telling them where to go in a very tactful way. Uh, to put it more, blunt, more bluntly, Paul was asking God to do away with these perverters of the true gospel. He really was. And Paul, Paul uh, further describes the Judaizers in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Notice how he describes them. False brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. See, Paul had them pegged. He knew who they were, what they were trying to do. And there are people in our world today who are just like these Judaizers, who are trying to impose religious obligations on people which have little to nothing to do with a true relationship with Jesus Christ. We are not called to a religion. We are called to a living relationship with a vibrant living Savior who passionately loves his people and is intricately involved in the affairs of mankind's lives. And he's, he's so real where he knows all of our weaknesses and God chose to love us anyhow. I'm so glad that he didn't have to whitewash the truth, but he washed us white with his grace and his blood. I'm so thankful for that. But the question, as they arose and dealt with a religious issue here, because here was a conflict between religious people, and I'm not saying that all Jews are just religious people. Uh, I'm simply saying that there are some who are just sticklers for the law itself without having a real relationship with the lawgiver. And when we do that, you, you have the introduction of truth, having a confrontation with religion. Religion is what man says, God says. Truth is what God says. A huge difference. But the question is not, will I ever face conflict in my life, but when will I face conflict and how will I respond? That's the real question. That's the issue with which we face the world. And let me say this to you. Unresolved conflict leads to separation and isolation. If you have unresolved conflict, 
It leads to separation and isolation. Whether it's unresolved conflict in a marriage, in a business relationship, in a church, in a government, unresolved conflict leads to separation and isolation. Between two friends, if there's a conflict and there's never a resolve to it, unresolved conflict leads to separation and isolation. Now, I want to teach you some conflict resolution skills. Is that okay? But I want to first list for you some conflict resolution methods that don't work so that we can avoid them. Uh, sometimes in learning what to do, you have to first learn what not to do. And learning what not to do becomes the first teaching in what to do. The very first thing in terms of resolving conflict, don't expect for conflict to be res resolved by number one, avoidance. Avoidance. You will never conquer what you are unwilling to confront. You will never conquer what you are unwilling to confront. If you face it, God will help you to fix it. But you've got to confront it. If you don't avoid, if you keep avoiding people that you are perturbed with, why will they change? How will they even know that what they are doing is offensive to you? So you do not resolve conflict by simple avoidance. Number two, what does not work is the silent treatment. I know some people thought that that was God's gift to you. Was to just give them the silent treatment. But people fail to get along because they fear each other. And they fear each other, Martin Luther King said this, they fear each other because they don't know each other and they don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. Communication is the basis of relationship. Relationships are the essence of life, but communication is the basis of relationship. When you get people who stop talking, you begin to damage severely the relationship. You all have an argument and you all walk around for three days without speaking, you better watch. You better watch it. Dangerous, dangerous. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.